facing urban housing today. This fall, we are hosting a series of informal and open conversations on housing race, racism and whiteness. Each session fo focuses on a specific theme with an expert practitioner as part of our efforts to explicitly integrate an anti-racist agenda into our current lines of work. Today, we are joined by Cecilia King from the MS Red class of 2015 and founder and managing partner of Kipling Development. Cecilia is a real estate developer and consultant focused on residential development opportunities in Detroit, Michigan and New Jersey urban centers. During the last five years of her career, she has been involved in cultivating $500 million of real estate development projects in Detroit and was appointed as a development director for the city of Detroit's housing and revitalization department. In 2018, Cecilia launched her own real estate development and consulting practice. As a consultant, she specializes in financial analysis, underwriting, and large-scale development strategies. As a developer, she primarily focuses on residential development, pursuing both new construction and value-add rehab opportunities with an emphasis on creating opportunities for ownership. Cecilia, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to learning more about your work. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to come back and spend some time speaking with uh, Columbia students, maybe alumni. I see a few familiar places. Hi, Jessica, it's been forever. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I was really excited to be reached out to, to um, be a part of this conversation series this fall um, because I think there's two things that the last five years of my work in, that my, the, my work in Detroit has centered on and it's been housing and it's been race because of the type of, one, the city that I've been working in, but then two, also just myself as a black American in real estate development and really specifically a focus on finance um, and just like the color, the lens that, that I bring, I think to the industry when I'm looking at the types of projects that I'm working with, to the teams that I'm working on um, and people that I'm working with and for. Um, so I'm excited to share a little bit about my work. Um, I was gonna talk about myself a little bit, but <laughs> you heard a lot about me. Um, I do want to, I was curious to see who, what, what some of the makeup of um, you all are, where some of your interests are. I'd like to keep this as conversational as possible. I've listened to a few of these. I know some people skew toward presenting, some people skew toward conversation. I definitely want this to be an open um, dialogue. Um, so feel free to interrupt me, ask questions as we go along. Um, I want to talk about a project that I'm currently working on um, in Detroit. And then I also had a couple of thoughts um, related to, I think, my experience as a professional in the housing industry with a specific lens on affordable housing, but then how that ties to this idea of racial equity and development. I have like four main ideas. I wouldn't call them necessarily gripes with the industry. I wouldn't call them um, issues. I think they're just um, discussion points. And I hope that it does, it does turn into a conversation around some of these, some of these ideas. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my screen. Actually, what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit about myself. Um, if anyone who has their camera on or is interested in um, unmuting themselves wants to, you know, share maybe what program you're from, just so I have a sense of who I'm talking to um, from the various programs of DSAP, that'd be really helpful for me. Um, just so I can kind of tailor um, some of the things I might emphasize um, as I go along. Um, but like you've heard, um, I was MS Red class of 2015. I've spent my career actually, I would say in real estate, just at very different sides of the table. So I actually started out as a structural engineer. My undergrad is from Princeton in civil engineering. I did a minor in urban studies. At the time, I didn't realize why I was interested in urban studies. I didn't know what I was gonna do with that urban studies. I thought I was gonna be an engineer. Um, I went on and did a master's in structural and started working as a structural engineer and realized that pretty quickly in my career that it wasn't the long-term career decision for me. I loved what I was doing. I always loved the built environment. I loved the real estate industry, but I needed to figure out a way to have a bigger picture perspective of what's going on in the project. Um, for me as an engineer, I, I, I wasn't 
satisfied with, you know, making something, making something stand up, frankly, after decisions have been made about what's going there, what's how it's going to look and why it's being done. Um, and so for me, the MS Red program was that perfect complement to the design and construction background that I had to be able to kind of balance myself out and learn the business side um, of the deal table. Um, so I, I went into the MS Red program specifically for two reasons. One, because I had this design background and wanted to supplement it. And then two, what I was really drawn to was the fact that there were so many adjuncts at um, GSAP, specifically in the MS Red program, who were working in practice at the time. And so um, being able to get real world experience, real world interaction with people who, you know, were coming from work and were teaching a class was much less theoretical for me than some of the other programs I looked at. Um, some of the other disciplines I was looking at. And ultimately for me, I knew I wanted to do real estate. So it made more sense for me to do MS Red or even doing an MBA. Um, so that's just a little bit of my like personal reason why I like MS Red was the right fit for me. And it's something that I definitely credit this like second half of my career to date um, with setting me up with a number of my connections, even in the work that I do in Detroit, the people I work with today. And some of the work that I'm doing now is in collaboration with some of my classmates from the MS Red program. So it's been a really formative decision for me personally um, and professionally to be a part of the MS Red program. Um, I think one of the things that, so since I left um, MS Red, um, the last five years for me have been almost exclusively focused on Detroit. Um, I was appointed as a development director for the city of Detroit's housing revitalization department right out of school. Um, and it was interesting because I was brought in under that administration because I had private sector experience. So for the, I'm going to talk a little bit about Detroit um, a little bit later, but I think what that perspective, what the perspective that that role gave me um, was unique because I don't think I would have worked in the public sector in necessarily any other city. Um, and I obviously have landed back in the private sector, but having that understanding of what's going on in the background and on the other side of the table, if you will, has been really important in my value add as a consultant for sure. And in my understanding of how projects are put together um, as a developer. Um, as Kipling development, um, I started that in 2018 after finishing at the city. As a consultant, I have worked almost exclusively with um, developers who are a bit on the smaller side in their shops. And what they do is they bring me in to add capacity. So if they're not interested in like building out a whole shop and hiring a ton of employees, but they're really trying to build their deal pipeline. Um, I will come in and I will, um, for example, one project is a condo conversion in a historic district and I will manage pre-development, for example, for that project. Or on the other end of the spectrum, I have, um, again, a friend or colleague um, who needed assistance um, building his deal pipeline. He's looking at a $65 million tower that's going to be mixed use um, picture retail at the bottom with some office, hotel, condo, um, and is looking to play some equity, is looking to do a bit of pre-development. Um, and once that deal lands, he'll have the you know, developer fee to hire staff. But in the interim, he doesn't want to like take on the additional load. So that's, where I, that's been my sweet spot as a consultant um, over the last two, three years. Um, so it allows me to see a lot of different types of deals. Um, while also allowing me to also work on my own deals. So as a developer, um, switching hats from, from, from like larger scale stuff, I really love residential. I love smaller scale. I love historic rehab. I love, or historic neighborhoods. I love there to be character. I love there to be, a, just the, the scale for me is very important. The hominess of what I'm developing um, and the attention to detail is something that's really important to me. 
Um, obviously I'm also not, <laughs> I don't have the, the net worth to support like a large, much larger development as well. So a lot of my projects tend to be on the smaller side, but it also is like manageable for me to um, do projects myself, to do them in partnership with others. And it gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, so I've been talking for a bit. I would love to understand what some of the programs are that are sitting in front of me, whether you guys are MS Red, if you're MR, if you're dual degree, if you are uh, urban planning, um, anyone who's willing to just chime in, maybe say your name and what program you're with, just for my, for my uh, edification. Come on, hands up all the best red. <laughs> We've okay, got a few, quite a few there for you, Cecily. All right, awesome. And I saw some more people because it's about 30. Okay, so I see there's another screen. Cool. What about uh, dual degrees? Cool. Awesome. Uh, maybe urban planning. And there's a lot of people. I'm like scrolling back and forth, and half the people have the cameras on, half people don't. <laughs> um, historic preservation. Did I miss it? There's one, I see two, maybe. I think that was two. Okay, cool. So this is a, a good mix. Okay, awesome. Um, so I have I'm gonna put some slides up on the screen. Um and talk, it's a little awkward because I won't be able to see your faces. So if you have a question, either drop it in the chat or just start talking over me, because that, that's fine with me. Okay, so uh let me. One, make sure I have everything where it needed to be. Cool. I want to share. And let me know if you can see this. Oops. Not that bad. <laughs> that was very good. Yep. <laughs> you guys can see that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I have clicked through these a little bit. What I wanted to kind of start in this talk about affordable housing and, and racial equity is, again, I don't want to talk all the time. So maybe if there's someone who has their, uh, who's quick to, to unmute, I'd love to hear a couple of thoughts of what you think about or what your perception is when you hear the word housing. Anybody, <laughs> one word. Shortage. Shortage. Okay, I'm gonna take a few, a few notes as you guys are saying that. Protection. Protection. Community. Okay. Maybe one more. Ownership. Ownership. All right, so when I say affordable housing, any first impressions, first thoughts? Real shortage. <laughs> uh, mixed income. <laughs> Cheaply made. What did you say? Cheaply made. Cheaply made. Uh, wait lists. Wait lists. Okay, cool. Community center. Community center, you said? Yes. Okay. Cool. So I'm just going to hold those thoughts for a second um, as I continue through this presentation. Um, another question, how familiar are any of you with Detroit? Out of curiosity. I am. You are. What's your context for it? Um, I uh, project managed a development right there on the river, uh, kind of downtown, called okay. Orleans Landing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I'm actually from Toledo. Okay. Like 45 minutes. <laughs> and a lot of time in Detroit. Okay, cool. Anyone else have any connections to Detroit? I should say I am originally from New Jersey, uh, born and raised. I've lived uh, several different places um, up and down the East Coast in Detroit for the last five years. Um, I am currently where I'm sitting right now is northern New Jersey, right outside of Newark. My family's from here 
it's been an easier place to be uh, in this weird, weird time that we're in right now <laughs> for family reasons. Um, so just a little bit of context about me and my relationship with Detroit. Um, the, so for a little bit of <laughs> framing for why Detroit is so important to me in this conversation of affordable housing, racial equity, um, anyone have an idea of how non-white Detroit is as a percentage of population? I know you know. I, believe I, do. I, believe <laughs> I, do. I can I can make a, a guess, but I'll wait for someone else. Anyone? That's okay. Can I just, I'll just guess 75, 25. 75, 25, okay. So the answer is upwards of 85%, as high as 87% black. And that's not, in, not including other non-white minorities. Um, any sense for how poor Detroit is as a, using median income as a measure? I know you sure. probably. <laughs> yeah. So the median income is under $20,000. It is still one of the top 10, even with um, population decline since, let's say, even the mid 90s. Um, it's still one of the top 10 cities in terms of size, population size in the United States. So just thinking about the, 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 the magnitude of majority minority community, poor um, economic demographic, like majority poor economic demographic. Um, but then also just as a quick comparison for you guys, the, I, I asked this question, but the cost of living in Detroit, if you're in Manhattan and you make $100,000, to match that quality of life in Detroit, you only need to make 40000 So just for some like context on like how different a major urban city, urban center in the United States can be from where you all are going to school in the context of racial equity and development and affordable housing, I wanted to set that framework for you guys, for those of you who may not be um, as familiar with Detroit. And Detroit's an interesting story because it was not like this. Um, at its prime, it was one of the wealthiest cities in the United States. It was built on, a, like many cities, a manufacturing industry, specifically the auto industry, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, it's where Henry Ford piloted his $5 a day wage. So in terms of like the idea of the American dream, like everyone having a house and a driver with a car in it and the 2.5 kids or whatever the, the percentages you're supposed to have, um, that was like the epitome and the representation um, for, for that, that idea of, like I said, the American dream. And I think there's been like several compounding issues over the decades that have led to um, kind of where it is today. One of the most devastating for communities of color is obviously urban renewal projects, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. There is um, still like large swaths of the city that are have been decimated from a neighborhood perspective because of decisions that were made in terms of um, lack of housing because of decisions that were made during that period of time. Um, that, that has resulted in the, I would say, white flight and money flight to the suburbs. Um, and so you have this really interesting, and then politically, you have a very interesting differentiation between the city and the rest of the surrounding state. So when you're talking about public subsidies, you're talking about decisions being made at the state, local, and um, state, local, state, local, and even national government level related to housing, there's a lot of tension that's a result of some of these socioeconomic decisions that have been made over the last um, several decades. So when I was in Detroit as a housing director, um, or direct, one of the directors in the housing department, um, I was responsible for managing public investment in multifamily and mixed use projects, similarly to the one that you mentioned, Eric, Orleans Landing, um, where the city is a recipient of HUD funds, among other things, um, that are redistributed to affordable housing development projects. And so it's city partnership on uh, land, it's a uh, city partnership on investing dollars. It might be tax abatements or other resources like that. Um, it's a lot of community engagement and understanding 
where needs are, and then also being able to find private sector partners who are able to meet those needs um, for the, on behalf of and for the community. Um, so my, my perspective of affordable housing is coming from the private sector and the public sector. Um, I also have some nonprofit and quasi government experience as well. So I, it's, it's a dual perspective that I'm bringing to the table as I'm having this conversation around affordable housing. Um, one of the challenges from a development perspective in Detroit, given what I've told you guys about some of the socioeconomic and demographic um, makeup of the city is um, investment as is a challenge, frankly. Um, when you're talking about just at a very high level, it costs the same to build something in Detroit as it does to say build it in New Jersey. But when your rent levels are adjusted for the $100,000 versus the $40,000 and you, you, you uh, play that out to how much someone's willing or able to pay in rent or expects to pay in rent, you're talking about very, very different project economics. Um, one of the major challenges in producing affordable housing is construction cost. Um, and then on the flip side, equity investment and the expected return of equity investors in a city like Detroit, if they're looking at a comparable project in say New Jersey or New York, you're looking at very different IRRs, equity multiples, et cetera, cash on cash is completely different. Um, and so there's a certain appetite for investment that there's a, there's a certain investor that will have the appetite for that and a certain investor that, that frankly cannot. Um, and so finding funds and putting together capital stacks ends up being quite um, complicated um, in being able to produce the affordable housing that is needed to meet the population demographics that I described to you um, earlier. Um, all because of another layer is because of the difficulty and challenges of Detroit, of Detroit development, you don't have a very deep developer pipeline. Um, and as a result, projects tend to take a bit longer. They take, tend to take a long time. You also tend to have less experienced developers that are trying to produce what they see as a need um, in the city they might be from or a region that they're from, struggling to, to put together capital, struggling to um, put together a deal that makes economic sense, but then also having, with the, with the lack of experience, you're not competitive necessarily for like a live tech allocation, for example, that would change the demographics, that would change the economics of your project. So you're challenged by not only the economics of the deal, but in the number, the, the quality of developers that you're seeing that are produced, that are trying to produce the number of housing units that are needed to meet the population. Um, it's also an interesting place from a typology perspective because Detroit is not as dense as New York in any way, shape, or form. Like it is a very large landmass. Um, and it has, again, like I said, that single family history. So you have a lot of historic properties or not historic, old properties. And you also have, um, they're in a single family context, a not dense single family context. There isn't great transit. There's no subway system like there is in New York or in the Northeast, in Northeastern cities. Um, and so you have this, this, this well, part of the reason why you have this like economic tension is because you have a dispersed population that's not necessarily easily able to access jobs that are in the city because of a lack of transit. And you don't have dense development where you're actually in close proximity to where you're living. So that one of the other challenges of affordable housing is finding great sites for, that are proximate to resources and um, employers to serve a population that will have a limited access to transit. And again, like Eric, your project with uh, Orleans Landing, I'm sure you could speak to that at length, um, what some of the challenges of that site were, but also what some of the great opportunities were for that site on the river just outside of downtown. Um, one of the, and the, last, the last point I'll make about Detroit affordability challenges right now is, so there was definitely an influx of LIHTC projects in, I mean, 15 plus years ago now. 
And those projects are reaching the end of their life cycle, where they have the opportunity to be marked to market. Their, their, their affordability is expiring, and a lot of them have very deep capital needs but the investment in them doesn't necessarily make sense. So it's almost like doubling back on projects that were previously publicly subsidized or subsidized through, or, or funded through LIHTC um, to almost like rebuild the capital stack and reposition that project um, with these challenging economics in this challenging location that may not necessarily be the right it wouldn't, if that project were done today, it probably wouldn't be done in the same place or in the same way. So those are some of the, the biggest challenges that I saw from the public sector side and I see from the private sector side in Detroit related to affordable housing, colored by just the 85% non-white, 87% non-white uh, population that we're talking about serving. So before I... Um, talk about a, a project that I'm working on. Um, any questions about what I've said so far? Yes, no? Okay, cool. So I am currently working on a project called Elementa. Um, and it is a mixed income for sale project. And the reason why I thought I'll explain to you a little bit how I, how I got to this, this, this particular, um, how I got to this project. So I believe the next slide gives you some context. Okay, so let me move this because you guys are looking at this screen. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Detroit, um, I think you guys can see my cursor, right? This is downtown Detroit. There's a river down here. Brush Park is this neighborhood here, the Star is a project. Um, this is just, I pulled some, um, some just excerpts from a, a deck that I have for various community presentations or investor uh, conversations. Um, but I wanted to give you guys some context for why this location. Um, so this project is about half mile north of the downtown Detroit Central Business District. So again, prime location, it's one of the few areas of density within the city. Um, it's just outside uh, the stadium district, which, which kind of surrounds here. So there's like an entertainment and stadium district here. Um, Midtown is kind of anchored by um, Wayne State University, which is um, one of the biggest universities in Michigan. Um, and there's also talks of a, the University of Michigan doing an innovation center down here. So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, um, a lot of energy um, and anchor tenants here. There's also, it's, it's proximate to the largest employers in Southeast Michigan. We have, you know, Google, LinkedIn, the hospitals, there's a whole hospital district up here. Um, there's Quicken Loans, Rocket Mortgage, which I guess they're, they're now calling themselves, um, but some of the largest employers in Michigan. So in terms of that, like access to jobs, limited need for transit, and um, just in terms of like uh, appeal, Brush Park is a historic and affluent neighborhood that has um, kind of stood the test of time in Detroit. Um, this is just some, some pictures that I pulled. There's been some significant reinvestment in, the, in this particular neighborhood over the last decade or so. Um, and so you end up having a lot of restored homes like this. This is this top picture here is the site to downtown. Um, is this just a view, a shot to downtown. So you're very, very proximate to um, the Central Business District. Um, as a project, the way I've conceived it, and I'll actually just flip back to this page, um, it's a 16 unit, like I said, mixed income for sale project. And the reason why I thought mixed income was a very important for this particular project is this is a desirable neighborhood that holds value. I think there is value in um, promoting equity and inclusivity through home ownership in when we're talking about affordability. And so I saw this site as a prime opportunity to display that type of project and that type of development um, in a very intentional way in Detroit. 
So the Brush Park neighborhood, I think I included some demographics of it. Um, this is a draft slide, but I just threw some stuff on here. Um, just to give you a sense of compared to the rest of Detroit, population, education levels, um, percentage of households earning a, over 100,000 and median home value, just like the delta of this particular neighborhood and why this neighborhood is seen as a, as a, as a desirable place um, to, a desirable place to own a home. And so my idea about creating value for those who traditionally been excluded from these types of projects hinges on being located in a neighborhood that has value for residents. And one of the most important things about this project has been um, being able to use two things. Um, the approach from an economic perspective to be able to facilitate doing affordable for sale is facilitated by the fact that the market in this neighborhood is so strong. So if you're talking about a 25 or even 50% affordable project, um, where um, you're able to achieve a blended dollar per square foot on sale price that's carried, that carries the discounted units with the, that the, where the luxury or higher price market units carry the discount of the affordable units and allow there to still be like a, a, a high blended average uh, dollar per square foot across the project. Um, that's not always possible in a place like Detroit because not every neighborhood, the, the, the valuation of neighborhoods across the city is very, very different. Um, and then the second piece is uniformity. I think we all are familiar with the idea of mixed income projects and can you identify which units are affordable, which units are not, um, are the finishes different, are they in a different building, um, are all the studios the affordable units and everything else is not. Um, just the inequality across projects. And so a uniformity of, of units within this project was really important for me as a developer um, because the only way that value is maintained across units, whether it be from when you're looking at appraisals on the, on the back end for someone selling it, you want there to be um, a comparable for that unit that isn't impacted by other units next to it. So. Uh, it's in everyone's best interest for the units to be uniform and the way that um, certain, in, certain changes are made within the project is going to be through upgrades versus downgrades. So it's a standard baseline. And then if there's other uh, amenities or features that are interested in being added to particular units, that's where the Delta can come in um, in terms of value created or frankly money spent on the project on your particular unit. Um, so just in terms of timeline, like I, this is a historic district, so I'm going for historic district approval um, on Wednesday. Um, right after that is the special zoning district, so I have <laughs> zoning approval next month, uh, with the goal being by the end of this year to have all the necessary city approvals from a design perspective to be able to aim for next construction season um, in the middle of equity raise right now um, with the goal, like I said, to, to be able to close and start construction. Um, on everything next construction season. And it's about an 18 month um, construction timeline for this one. Um, I think the reason why this project, the one last point for me on this project is one, one of the reasons why it was important for me to do this one as, again, a mixed income for sale is because going back to this idea of affordable housing, I think one of the challenges that I see in the discussion around affordable housing is one, we only, we usually only talk about rental. Um, we often only talk about it as, I think it's, I think affordable housing is an option within the continuum of housing um, in a particular community. But I don't think affordable housing needs to be seen only as an end state for people who live there. There are people who, I think optionality for people in terms of housing options of which affordable units or more price accessible. I even don't love the word affordable um, because when we're talking about affordable, affordable varies from city to city. I think the idea of like price accessible housing in both for sale and, and rental um, units is 
an important consideration as we're talking about housing, the, the continuum of what housing is. Um, any questions or thoughts or comments or anything so far? Um, I have a question since you talked about being in the process of equity raising right now. Mm -hmm. um, and you earlier spoke about the challenges of finding um, equity investment in Detroit. So I was just curious if you could elaborate on that process. Yeah, so there is a, a lot of interest, I think, in investing in Detroit. I found, this is me speaking from personal experience, I found there to be a lot of interest in investing in Detroit. I think there is a, um, there was, when I first moved to Detroit, there was this idea that you could buy a house for a dollar and like make a ton of money. And that's, that's, that's not the case. Um, it's, or maybe a thousand dollars or whatever it was. Um, so I think there's been a lot of, what I found is there's a lot of interest in investing in Detroit, but like I said, when you, depending on how you're structured, what returns you're looking for, what kind of timeline you're looking at, um, on your, on your funds, um, Detroit isn't always, hasn't always been the best fit for people. Um, who are looking to place money. Um, I think that is exacerbated in the rental market, um, especially the affordable rental market. If you're competing for public subsidy, if you're competing for LIHTC, the numbers end up working out better for those projects, but the timelines are extremely extended. Um, if you're doing unsubsidized rental units, um, like just market rental, the even the strong market units, the economics don't necessarily work for a lot of equity. Where I have seen equity be the most, um, it where I have seen equity be, be successful, equity raises be successful, is in the for sale market in neighborhoods like this one, because the market fundamentals are so strong. Um, the yeah, the market is so strong. There's not a lot of one, it's a very small neighborhood. It's in high demand. Um, units that go for sale here go for sale at like good, strong market values. And you often have multiple offers on projects or, or on units. Um, and so when you're talking about the for sale market in this particular neighborhood, it's very different than if we're talking about um, like investment in rental units. And I think the the appeal of this project from an investor's perspective is you're, if you're interested in investing in affordable, this is a way to invest in mixed income affordable that has stronger returns than if you were doing an, an affordable rental project or even just a market rental project. Um, I also had a question. Yeah. Um, if you sell a unit and it's listed as affordable, how long does it keep that designation? Because you could imagine there could be a lot of issues with, you know, down the road, transferring that property some, to somebody else and... Yes. So it depends on how you finance it. So this project is being done, um, it is being acquired from the city of Detroit, but there is no public subsidy in it. Um, there are, though, there's a tax abatement that's in place for this particular site for future homeowners. Um, but in terms of the developer me signing on like loan documents or public subsidy documents with the city, there is no deed restriction that's accompanied by any of those dollars as might cloud um, a project that has like federal dollars in it that has, you know, a 10 year or 15 year or 30 year requirement for affordability or a repayment clause where if you sell this unit within you know, five years, it doesn't burn off for five years. So if you sell it in year one, you have to pay back 80% of whatever the discount was that you got. So in terms of like D, like um, prescribed deed restriction, there is none on this project. The, um, what, the, the appeal of doing it this way though, is that I'm allowed to set the rules in the condo documents of what it would look like um, as affordable um, but the way that these projects, um, the way these units are going to be listed, they're not necessarily listed specifically as affordable. The target is through pre-sale and it's in, intentionally targeted at first time home buyers that qualify at 80% AMI. And there's a specific price point for locking in at this particular um, juncture in the project. 
And that's the first rollout before they're publicly marketed. And it's in concert with a nonprofit who works on um, homeownership um, assistance, um, homeowner ed home buyer education. And um, so there's like a, almost like a exclusive pipeline that's focused on this particular um, demographic, if you will, um, that would fill the affordable quote unquote units of this particular project. But uh, after you sell the unit, it's sort of out of your hands. It, it, if that person breaks that rule or, and then has to, let's say, pay back 80%, uh, the government's going to go after them, not you. So the government would not necessarily go after them because it's not deep restricted through federal. So it's, it would be, if in this particular project, it could be in the homeowner association documents. It could be in the condo documents. It can be structured in that way because it's not the type of, it's not like a, a HUD financed project where HUD is like, I gave a hundred thousand dollars toward this unit. I expect it to be um, an affordable, um, someone who qualifies at 80% AMI. If they sell it within a year um, and they make money, I need that money back. I need to recoup my value. It's not structured that way. I see. I had a question. So, but in terms of the way that uh, some of the prospective buyers are qualifying is that they are sort of receiving soft second mortgages, correct? Yes. Okay. So it will look like a soft second mortgage, but what, so there's, there's, there's conversations I'm having with um, community development financial institutions, CDFIs that are more uh, community focused. Um, they have softer dollars than like a traditional bank. And so in their loan documents with these particular home buyers, there may be something in there that where there's like recapture of whatnot. But in terms of maintaining the distribution of um, affordability within the, within the community, that's within the actual condo docs themselves. Now the challenge with that is if you're creating value for someone who is a first time home buyer qualifying at 80% AMI, the challenge is how much, and this is a bit philosophical, but how much do you want to restrict their ability to actually be able to realize that value? Um, and so that is, are you just, you know, selling someone a home that then has to be sold to an 80% AMI home buyer who can only qualify for a certain price. So even if it's worth X, they can only pay X minus um, or Y or whatever. Um, then that person doesn't get to realize the appraised value in, of that particular property. So that's one thing that is one of the challenges of doing affordable for sale, um, again, philosophically. Um, and that's something that I'm working through with this project is how much restriction do I want to leave on that first time buyer? Because if the, if the goal is to create value, how do you have them also see value as well? Any other question? I guess I'm really curious in how you've been thinking about that trade-off. Like, how do you make that decision? Because that goes back to some of the big philosophical things we've been tangling with at the lab and the talk um, this spring, you know, and just family wealth. And, and how do you... Oops. I want to stop sharing real quick just to like see you guys' faces. Yeah, no, that is... Um, a conversation I have probably on a <laughs> on a, at least a monthly basis um, as I'm putting together the capital stack for this project. Um, my first gut, like just just thinking out loud a little bit, my first gut reaction was I don't want to restrict anything. Um, so I want people to be able to sell their unit and maintain value. I think that's very idealistic um, because I think the challenge of someone purchasing a home and you know for a discount frankly and then flipping it to someone who is not first time home buyer not 80 percent ami whatever that that category is then you'll end up with a 100 percent market rate project just like everyone else um and so that's genuinely one of the things i'm struggling with in the affordable for sale space because yes you will have an asset on your books that assuming there's no like deed restriction that like hampers the value of your project, 
as an appraised value, as an impact on your net worth as a homeowner, it's great. But when do you actually, or when you, when is it turn from paper to actual dollars? That point, is it that some of the things I'm considering are time, amount of time spent in the project, in the property. Um, maybe there's like a step up where it's not 80%, but it could be someone who qualifies as like 100% or something like that. Um, there's a couple of different ideas. If there's ideas that you guys have about, or that you guys have been discussing, I'd love to hear them. But it genuinely is one of the challenges of, um, of not being the long-term owner. Um, and at the end of the day, it's a condo association. So if they want to change the rules and change the laws, they can do that as well. Um, so discussion, I don't have an answer. It is a uh, conversation <laughs> with my, like I said, attorney, finance, et cetera. We're all trying to figure out what the what the answer is it might not be the right answer is but what is the answer that we're going to go with for this particular project given that there's no like i said federal dollars in there to, to drive that conversation there's no city dollars in there to, to force that conversation it is ultimately the decision that i as a developer can make you don't want to burden them with inability to sell when they need to move for a better job yeah yeah you don't want it to be a burden like it, you don't want this the, the 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 opportunity to turn into a burden or a curse and you want people to be able to maximize the decisions and maximize the value of the decision that they're making exactly I've, I've got a question if i could um first of all i'm from ann arbor so detroit's near and dear to my heart um sure. go, go blue and um <laughs> i think it's a great looking project i'm curious what profile of, of investors or partners have you found are, are open and excited by this type of project? And, and with that, what have been some of your hurdles, pitching it, responses, um, feedback that you've gotten from, from doing that? Yeah, so I'll actually skip forward a little bit into something I was going to kind of end this session on. Um, in parallel to what I'm doing as, you know, me, myself, and I, developer consultant, um, through my Columbia network, um, I've stayed in very close contact with some of my classmates. And one of the things that we've been working on for the for past couple of years, um, and there'll be, there'll be more information I share with you guys as like this gets rolled out over the next month or so, is we've been putting together um, an equity fund, specifically focused on majority and minority communities, and specifically focused on investing in developers, sponsors, property owners of color in those communities across the United States. Um, and so we've been building a pipeline of projects um, to fund in neighborhoods like this with that have strong economics, even within more challenging um, urban centers. And so that this project is being, is part of the conversation um, of that like equity raise. And so, Again, there's a specific type of investor that is looking to, let's say, do well and do good, that might have a little bit of a different economic um, incentive um, than, you know, a larger institutional investor, frankly. Yep. Um, I think we, we had, it, the funny is we had originally started working on this, like I said, a couple of years ago, and honestly had put it on the back burner, um, I would say, when COVID hit in March. Um, April, February, whenever it was, March, I think it was. Um, and then May happened. And the complete shift in the socioeconomic and political climate as a result of like some really devastating um, events um, of the spring and the summer um, really kind of threw the idea of like, what does equity look like in urban centers back into focus? and really like shifted our focus back to that again. Um, and so the appetite for one, investing a, fine, a, a, a vehicle that's specifically focused on these majority minority communities and ownership within them, there is a specific demographic of investors that we've targeted as a result of that. Likewise, again, the, 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 the onus on me to figure out something like affordable for sale for that investor pool is something that I've been kind of charged with, with using this project as a pilot because this at the end of the day is something that they want to see because one of the challenges, 
and this kind of leads me into some of the, my, my discussion thoughts. One of the things that I don't, um, yeah, one of the things that I, 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 I always push for when I'm talking about affordable housing in like this professional context is what does it look like to really be an impactful investor in communities of color? Um, one of them, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip back to this as a reminder to myself. Actually, there was four things in the chat. Let me see. Cool. That's that's awesome. Thank you, and I'd love to hear more about that that program. Yeah. So what I will do is we're rolling that out. We have like November 2020 on <laughs> on everything right now. Um, so it is. It's going to be a very interesting, um, it's going to be a very interesting and unique um, investment opportunity. I will definitely share it with you guys because it is pitched at a range of investors, a range of participation levels, and a range of involvement in different types of projects. So I think it'd be the perfect thing for you guys to look at. Um, we definitely love your feedback as we're going through it. And maybe it's just an opportunity for, maybe I'll bring like my partners along um, we can give you guys an intro to, you know, what we're thinking and how we got there because um, his story is very interesting and in how he conceived the idea of this and um, the way that we work together and the things that we've chosen to work on and the things we've, we've chosen to target and why, um, I think will be worth a discussion um, at a future date. Cecily, also, we'll, we'll introduce you to uh, at Brookfield you know, the big problem, they've, they've started a, a social impact fund. Yes. So, you know, you wouldn't want them taking, you know, the whole thing, but, you know, because you want people who are more flexible and, you know, and, and engaged. But yeah. they will provide a nice little sort of seed core of equity for you. So I'll introduce you to Rick Clark. I was, I was just talking about it this morning, yeah. That would be great. Hmm. Um, so we're, it's 155, which <laughs> I wasn't expecting this <laughs> to go as far as, as long as it did, but there are a couple of things that there's like two things I want to, I want you guys to take away and I'm going to just like kind of fast forward through. I don't think it's worth, I'll, I'll share my screen, um, for just whatever. Um, but there were, I think I'm going to skip over one of these and I'm going to, because I think it just goes too far. <laughs> the of time. I want to hear them. Uh, I'll, I will say them. How about that? I'll say them and we'll go from there. Uh, am I sharing and then view full screen mode. Okay, so we talked about this, talked about this. Da, 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 da. Um, I talked a little bit about my issue with affordable housing, lowercase or uppercase a, being seen as other housing within the continuum of housing options. I think like the, the notion of like affordable housing as being something that's over there or an other type of housing is something you definitely see reflected in like, especially like community meetings where you, you guys have all heard about like the NIMBY culture of like, I don't want to see that type of project in my particular community. But one of the most humbling things that I've seen happen in community meetings is when you pull up the HUD AMI chart of like what qualifies for affordable, and especially in communities like this, it's a little different in New York, but like what a family of four needs to make in order to qualify for housing and the room changes because the idea of how close or how in the middle of that demographic you actually are is something that a lot of people don't necessarily recognize when you use the word affordable housing. So that's one takeaway. Two, um, definitely a longer conversation for another day is my, I would say, issue with the lazy use of the word gentrification. I think at the end of the day, everyone wants to live in a desirable neighborhood. But I think what we're, we're glossing over is the fact that gentrification is definitely an issue when there is displacement. Um, renters tend to be the most vulnerable population. I've also seen, even in homeowners, people who are on a fixed income or perhaps inherited a property and don't have the necessary cash flow to maintain it, they're the ones who get kind of left out when property values change. But if you think about like where you live, I myself am a homeowner, um, I've had some pretty crazy like property value increases as a result of COVID and people moving out of the city into northern New Jersey. Um, and so as a homeowner, I don't have a necessarily an issue with property values going up. 
as a small business owner, um, having people who have disposable income to spend money and patronize your shop is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, having a higher tax base to be able to provide goods and services to a community. I think as you're, as you're talking about that, don't be lazy about your use of the word gentrification. Because I think, again, putting the lens of color back on it, what I've found is people's reaction is let's leave communities of color alone because gentrification when I think it's very dangerous to not invest in communities of color because you don't, you want to, you're, you're in, in the quest to protect, are you actually depriving them of investment? So that's a question and challenge to you all. Um, this I'm skipping over, totally skipping over. One of the other things I find really fascinating about uh, our society is we're ugh, capitalist, I think, as America. I think everyone would agree with that. But when you think about housing, it's one of the few things that we have a very specific socialist approach to, specifically affordable housing. Um, and then taking affordable housing off the table again, I think we saw this or we were watching this play out as a result of COVID and the renter population and the landlords and who is supposed to absorb the loss of, or the, the, the lack of rent being paid when the government has stayed evictions, but most people live in privately owned homes. So where does the actual onus sit in a supposedly capitalist society when uh, <laughs> you know, those things are at odds? You're talking about someone's home or you're talking about someone's business and, and, and where that, in, that, that, that uh, interference point is happening. Um, the last point uh, was a really jarring one I actually heard on a conversation last week. I, someone, the, the guy who was presenting it <laughs> said it. He called the affordable housing industry the plantation industry. And I heard it and it was really jarring, but I immediately knew what he meant. And just for like really quick context, U.S. racial makeup, 13% Black. In just HUD-funded um, housing units, and these are privately owned, it could be public housing, it could be privately owned through vouchers or certification certificates or Section 8. Um, about 50% are Black. So you have this over-indexing of a minority population in, a publicly, in publicly funded units, but like significantly because if only 13% of the United States is actually Black, this is a, like a, a, a dis distinct, um, distinct increase. Um, but for me, one of my challenges about the affordable housing industry and the development industry as a whole is the racial makeup of those who are in control of policy, in control of development, and who are making the development decisions about residents. Um, this is just a really bad screenshot of HUD, the HUD leadership. I can't go to every single affordable housing developer and show you their, show you their profiles, but I just thought, okay, well, what's the easiest? It's HUD. Um, and I have friends and colleagues that I've worked with that are on this page, love them dearly, their kids are great, et cetera. But when you're looking at this page and you're looking at what I showed you in terms of the demographic makeup of the units that are being funded by this particular organization, there's a definite difference. So when he said plantation industry, yeah, it's a little shocking, but if you play that out, which I'm sure you all can, I thought it was a very interesting way of describing it. Oh my God, cool. <laughs> um, great quote to end on that I love was um, used by, uh, I used to work with uh, Maurice Cox, who's now the uh, commissioner of planning for the city of Chicago. He was the head of planning in Detroit while I was there, but he would always open each community meeting talking about nothing without us about us is for us. And I think that this slide and talking about affordable housing, I think, and the idea of, of investment intention, investing intentionally, I think that quote um, speaks to what I'm trying to do as a developer of color um, in the affordable housing and or housing industry. Why do I stop sharing? <laughs> there we go. So it's 2.02, sorry I'm late, didn't think I would go that long. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Um, uh, I've noticed that Jizen, uh, who's a staff associate at the lab, has posted her email kindly. So if we have additional questions, we uh, please email them to Jizen and she can compile and send cool. over to Cecily later. But yeah, I'm looking at the chat now. I see, um, I see stuff that I couldn't see. What a fabulous question and conversation. And I think 
one of the, I just wanted to share that one of the things that the housing lab students have come up with is let's just, as a first step, let's just not dance around race. When we talk about housing, when we talk about HUD, who's there? Yeah. Who are they? <laughs> and who are they, trying, who are they saying they're serving? When we talk about displacement, let's talk about, you know, do we mean just random people being displaced? No, it's about, you know, the problems of, um, you know, Manhattanville, our problems of communities of color being pushed out because they're renters, right? Um, yeah. And that's a problem because they no longer have access to the subway and jobs and like be very upfront. So that's just seems like such a, a basic starting step though. And so inspiring to hear um, your talk as a way forward in the fund and, you know, count us in as your, as your team at the housing lab that we can help you. <laughs> that is good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe up with more yeah. I want to make space for other questions or just then um, if you have some comments. I was just going to say, I really appreciate um, your time today. And I'm, I, I think we always need more affordable for sale units. So thank you for doing that. Unfortunately, I have to go. I have a uh, sort of a workshop at two o'clock, but um, I'll get your contact information and I'll, I'll pass along some information. So one of my projects in New Orleans was part of a Hope 6 grant. We actually did affordable for sale as well. And I can give you some of the language that we use for that in terms of uh, the uh, ability to sell within a certain number of years. That would be really great. I would, I would sure. definitely appreciate that. No so and, thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. And Eric, uh, Cecily, if I can just sort of pre-announce, uh, Eric, we'll have Cecily with us teaching next semester. So wonderful. Excellent. What are Excellent. you um, teaching? Um, we're talking about that. I think it's going to be focused around uh, pre-development um, and just the development process. It'll be a deeper dive um, of what you guys currently doing, but with like a focus on that development track that I think uh, Patrice has been talking to me about, so. We're thrilled a bit, yep. <laughs> Thank um, you. What I can do is leave my contact information either, in the, actually you have it, um, be, feel free to share it with people. Um, my email address is, you know, that's where the best, probably the best way to reach me. Um, so if people have follow-up questions, I see some stuff in the chat. I want to pull down some like links people have recommended um, that I, I do want to like pull down. So um, I know those. So feel free to share with any of the attendees too. I should have put that somewhere, um, and I didn't. And Jessica too, if anyone wants. Oh. Um, okay, I. Thank you. This is amazing. And if it's, um, we'll reach out later, but if it's okay with you to have this recording be posted. Um, if anyone has objections, just write us and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week and we'll be in touch with you, um, Cecily. I think her screen's frozen. Bernadette. I think we might have lost her for a second. <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, it was wonderful to see you all so much we need to work on. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Have a good weekend. Hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. My bad. <laughs> hmm? Why don't you say it and you want to say it too bad? Hey. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, no, no Sorry. don't worry about it. I was just saying that you froze just a little bit at the end, but it was it was fine. Yeah, I didn't mean so I kicked myself out of Zoom and I didn't mean to. Um, so that was not supposed to be that abrupt of an, abrupt of an ending at all. Um, is there any way for me to be able to pull down the, uh, the information that was shared in the chat for that particular meeting? Uh, I can send you the chat if you want. That would be great because I didn't get to. 
Yeah, and uh, I think uh, GSN is going to compile all the questions and send them your way. Okay. No, that'd so be perfect. I will also tell her to uh, send you the chat and maybe the file that Eric shared. Okay, yeah, because all of that I wanted to pull down at the end. I just, I yeah. don't know what happened, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Bye. You too.